This is Steve Larson of the editorial staff here at Hortz Dairyman. We welcome all of you out there for uh, our uh, webinar today on feeding and handling of transition cows. I'm very happy to have with us Dr. Jim Drakeley uh, from the University of Illinois. And uh, we also appreciate the sponsorship of Elanco for today's webinar. And with those words of introduction, Mike Hutchins, our host, will take it from here. Very good, Steve. Welcome uh, our listeners back. Uh, we're excited uh, to have, have you back online here today and uh, a nice turnout as well. My, it's my honor actually to introduce a, co a colleague and co-worker of mine, uh, Dr. Jim Drakeley, who uh, is at the University of Illinois staff. Jim is a native from Minnesota, the southwestern part of Minnesota, and his fame to claim down there is that I judged his calf at a county fair and he was first. <laughs> he was first in the class and he was last in the class, but we'll, we'll, we'll let that alone at this point. Uh, Jim got his uh, bachelor's degree from South Dakota State University and Masters as well, and then a PhD at uh, Iowa State in 1989. He then joined the University of Illinois staff and has had a stellar record here in the area of energy metabolism, uh, in areas of not only what he's talking about today, but lipid metabolism, carbohydrate metabolism, also helped to write the 2001 NRC area on calves, on, uh, on calf growth and performance as well. He received numerous awards from the American Dairy Science Association and here at the University of Illinois, and was on the AD ADSA board. So Jim has got a plethora of activities and Jim we're pleased to have you with us today. We'll turn the microphone over to you and your title is Feeding and Handling of Transition Cows. Uh, welcome Dr. Jim Drakeley. Oh, thank you very much Mike and hello to everybody out there. I'm pleased to be here today to talk about uh, this area which has been a major part of our research program over the last uh, 20 years or so. So we'll, uh, we'll move into it here, and really we've been interested uh, for a long time in the question of how we best feed and manage dry cows and transition cows with the aim of minimizing health disorders, but also maximizing production and, and reproduction. And sometimes those goals seem to be a, a bit in conflict. Um, we're, we're talking today about the transition period, or sometimes called the periparturient period, and traditionally this is uh, considered to be the three weeks on either side of calving, so three weeks leading in up to calving and three weeks after. But what I'm going to talk to you today, uh, I hope I'll convince you that, that our evidence indicates we should be thinking about the entire dry period as, as really part of that transition and not success. Um, first of these is cow comfort, then dry period transition nutrition, which will be the main focus of today. And of course, a, a good health environment uh, with ample feeding space, things like uh, considering cooling during times of heat stress and so on. All these issues which we talk about for lactating cows are at least as important for the transition period. And oftentimes, facilities or, or management issues on the farm are having more of an impact in, in creating suboptimal nutritions than the, than the feeding program itself. So we're not going to talk more about that today, but it's a, another critical critical aspect and we need to, to keep that in mind uh, that we're not solving everything here by, by nutrition. So the transition health problems that we struggle with are at least associated with excessive negative energy balance or negative nutrient balance which leads to body fat mobilization, excessive body fat mobilization around calving. And so this is the, uh, the uh, one end of the spectrum of that series of changes which hopefully we don't see too often but uh, the extreme uh, uptake and, and deposition of fat by the liver uh, where we end up losing cows. So what we're going to talk about today is a nutritional strategy that we can use to hopefully uh, help improve that negative energy balance situation at and after calving and help prevent the excessive amount of, of body fat mobilization. So we're going to talk about controlling energy intake during the dry period to meet the cow's requirements but not allow under or overfeeding. So we know that uh, these times of excessive negative energy balance have negative outcomes for cows. Uh, there, there's a lot of literature in the, or a lot of examples in the scientific literature. This is a really powerful recent uh, series of reports from Cornell University. They did a large survey of TMR-fed freestall herds in the northeastern U.S. Uh, and looked at NEFA concentrations, non-esterified fatty acids in blood, or beta-hydroxybutyrate in blood as indicators of the degree of negative energy balance. And the series of studies pointed out that cows that had elevated NEFA or BHBA 
in the early post-calving period had about four and a half times greater risk for occurrence of metritis, displaced abomasum, or clinical ketosis. But they also had 13 to 16 percent lower risk of pregnancy. In other words, the cows did not get pregnant at the same rate. And they lost uh, 400 to 700 kilos of milk, up to, to 15 or 1,600 pounds less energy corrected milk in that lactation. So clearly, uh, excessive negative energy balance is associated with a, a loss of income in, in many ways. So we're okay. going to, we're, we're going to uh, give uh, Dr. Rickley a break. Here's your chance to vote. We'd like to find out what you're thinking out there. We've got nearly 55 people online right now. What are you thinking? Are you using or recommending uh, the controlled energy high fiber dry cow ranch for Dr. Drakeley you'll be launching into here? So you got a chance to, uh, Jim, have you got the polls open? The polls are open and uh, we're voting at this stage of the game and it uh, looks like the Democrats are in early. Uh, at this point, we've got a third of the people voting at this point and uh, we're off and running so we can see uh, Dr. Drakeley, you can get a little of a feel on that, and I'll let you report the results if you wish at this stage of the game. Uh, and uh, we're uh, once we get up to about 70 percent, you Republicans, we just cut you right off. That's all there is to it at this point. I know we got some Wisconsin people, and of course they just finished their big Republican recall up there. And uh, looks like we're kind of so we got another a few more people coming in here, and it looks like uh, we're going to close the polls. And uh, here we at. When we're doing that, uh, we could uh, remind people that they have the opportunity to ask, ask questions as we go along, so feel free to do that. So, okay? All right, so the re results of the poll here, 64% of you said yes, that you are using or recommending, 17% said in some situations, 8% no, and 11% not sure how to manage. So looks like uh, the, the topic, the concept is certainly uh, not foreign, and, and there's a, probably a fair degree of interest in, in some of these aspects. So let's move along. We'll talk about controlled energy diets, and this is the term that we've used to indicate trying to control the nutrient intake during the dry period to meet the cow's requirements. Very simple concept, uh, certainly not rocket science here. We're just trying to meet the requirements of the cows while allowing the cow not to overconsume relative to her requirements or not shorting her relative to her requirements. And also a, a, a desirable outcome is to try to make the intake more consistent throughout the dry period and avoid some of these decreases in intake or the large decreases in intake as the cow approaches calving. So we'll start here with the nutrient requirements uh, in terms of net energy as calculated from the NRC. And if you calculate the requirements for a mature cow and a first calving heifer, uh, before and after calving using the, the assumptions and equations in the NRC, we get a, a total requirement of around 14 to 15 megacalories of net energy per day, regardless of whether we're talking about a, a first calving heifer or an older cow. And of course that's due to the fact that the first calving heifer is, has a greater requirement for growth. So keep that number in mind, somewhere 14 to 15 megacalories prior to calving. Now after calving, you can see that the requirements for net energy are going to essentially double overnight or from one minute to the next as the cow uh, has the calf and begins milk production. As we look at the comparison relative to intake then, we can come very close to meeting requirements for energy and other nutrients during the, the gestation period, like pregnancy, uh, but we're not going to be able to meet the requirements, of course, for intake after calving, and so we have this period of, of negative energy balance for some time. During negative energy balance, then the cow responds by mobilizing her body fat stores, and that's reflected in the concentration of NEFA, non-esterified fatty acids, in blood. These are directly reflecting body fat breakdown and the, the need for the cow to mobilize that stored energy. So we have this kind of classical relationship here that as intake trends downward as the cow approaches calving, the concentration of NEFA in blood starts to increase. Usually this will peak very uh, quickly, shortly after calving, and then hopefully come down quite quickly as the cow's feed intake, dry matter intake, begins to increase quite rapidly. So we have this inverse relationship here between how cows are eating around the time of calving and the, uh, the amount that the NEFA in blood are elevated. 
There's been a, a lot of focus over the last 15 to 20 years on the drop in intake leading up to calving. And what I'll show you today is that we now are, f are understanding that the degree to which cows drop off is very much dependent on the diet. And we'll, we'll show some examples as we go through. So as we said, the elevated NEFA in blood are a, a clear risk factor for uh, other health problems and lost milk production, reproduction. And some of that is at least due to the, the fact that fat accumulation in the liver increases as the blood NEFA increases. That it, uh, fat content or liver fat accumulation will peak in the liver somewhere around 10 days to 14 days after calving. Usually this is a uh, not a harmful situation in itself. That the cow will have some increase but then be able to clear it out without problems. But as that degree of liver fat accumulation increases, we have, again, associations with a number of other problems. For example, increased incidence of ketosis and displaced abomasum, uh, impaired reproduction, decreased milk, more culling, and probably a factor in the, the greater incidence of death loss that we've had as, as herds have expanded, in, in the, at least in our country. One of the, the factors then that's central to this issue of, of controlled energy is that cows can quite easily consume enough dry matter to meet those requirements for energy. And we can do that with a variety of dietary strategies. So if you look at the energy densities in the left-hand column here, starting with an energy density of 1.3 megacals per kilo, or that's about 0.59 megacals per pound, this is where our high straw controlled energy diets are, are typically ending up. We need 11 and a half kilos of dry matter intake to get the 15 megacalories required by the cow. As we increase energy density more towards uh, something that might be uh, thought of as a typical close-up ration, then we need less dry matter intake, only 9.5 kilos uh, of dry matter intake to supply the 15 megacalories. So the, the message here is that we can do this, we can get that amount of energy in, and dry cows will easily consume more energy than they require. Here's an example demonstrating that, that last point. This was an experiment conducted uh, several years ago in which we had diets that were, uh, again, moderate energy density, probably a, like a, a typical close-up diet in, in energy density. And we fed those diets to cows during the dry period, either free choice or ad libitum, or we fed them in a slightly restricted manner so that they actually were, were slightly under their requirements, about 80% of their calculated requirements during the dry period. During the dry period, the cows that had the ad lib axis here had very high intakes. You can see uh, 16, 17 kilos, uh, upper 30 pound per day dry matter intake in the middle part of the dry period but then began to drop off very sharply in the last three weeks or so before calving. The cows that we fed the same diets, but in a, a restricted amount, consumed everything, uh, with the exception perhaps of a few cows on the actual day of calving. But those cows had much uh, faster rates of increase in dry matter intake after calving. So the cows that, that uh, we offer these moderate quality diets to did not regulate their energy to meet the requirements. They consumed considerably in excess, on average 56% more than they required during the dry period. And in the middle part of the dry period here, this is 85 to 90% more than they actually required. Uh-oh, that's probably not what we wanted to do. Okay, we're good. So why might that be a bad thing? This is a kind of a, a change in philosophy from several years ago. Uh, and we have uh, increasing evidence all the time that these cows that are overfed will respond metabolically like they're a fat cow, even if we will look at them and say that they're in, in optimal condition or even slightly on the thin side. And so you on the farm would see things like poorer appetites or lower intakes after calving, a greater degree of body fat mobilization, so higher NEFA, higher liver fat content, higher ketones that you might measure in, in urine or, or blood or milk. And as an example here from the, the study I just showed you, this is the liver fat content in the cows that were either uh, overfed with the ad lib feeding in the red here or the same diets fed in a restricted amount. Cows that were fed ad lib had about twice the fat content in the liver at one day after calving and uh, continuing on through uh, 14 days after calving. Uh, 
sorry about that. I'm having technical challenges here today. Should just use the button. Um, so the major uh, one of the major differences that led to those differences in liver fat content uh, is reflected here in the plasma NEFA concentrations. And cows that were being fed ad lib had very low NEFA in the dry period. Uh, but they started to increase uh, two to three weeks before calving or one to two weeks before calving as those intakes were trending down. The cows that were fed the, the diets in a, a restricted amount had chronically elevated NEFA, slightly elevated during the dry period, but you can see they come together at about the time of calving. Both of the, the groups of cows increased NEFA quite sharply right after calving. But the cows that were being fed the, the slightly restricted amounts of the diet came down much more quickly than the cows that were overfed during the dry period. So we think that, uh, that these high energy diets or high energy intakes during the dry period are another predisposing factor for health problems. This is not to say that all cows in the herd are going to have problems or that all herds are going to have problems but we think it's another risk factor so that if cows face a, an interruption of intake around or after calving so some stressor uh, lack of comfort disease poor management etc then if the cows have been overfed during the dry period they're more likely to get into this spiral of subclinical ketosis fatty liver and then the the other health problems that are associated with those two gatekeeper diseases so with that uh, justification for controlling intake, there's uh, at least a couple of strategies that we could look to implement on farms. One would be to limit feed higher quality diets, uh, somewhat similar to what I just showed you with the restricted intakes. That's difficult to do in dairy herds, though, where we have close-up groups that are, are dynamic in nature. We have cows moving in and out of those groups at least weekly, if not more often. And so it's a very difficult uh, management see, uh, scheme relative to beef feedlot, for example, when the cattle all come in together and stay together. can be done, but it, it is uh, much more problematic. So we're going to focus here today on the area that we've been, been giving more attention to from a research standpoint. That's the ad lib feeding, again, of high bulk or high forage diets. And we're going to allow the, that bulk to control total dry matter intake and so control energy and nutrient intake. But before I go on, I just want to state that we are confident that the restricted intake and the high bulk strategy are equivalent from the effects on the cows. So they're, they're, they're making equivalent metabolic effects on the cows. So the controlled energy high fiber program is not just about rumen fill. It's not just as simple as we're, we're stuffing those cows full of straw. We're actually creating some metabolic changes that we can mimic by actually slightly uh, limiting feed intake. So the simple uh, solution here is, is that we have to use something of lower energy density to decrease total energy density of the diet, uh, where things like corn silage have become much more important as a base forage even for dry cows. So to, to use some lower energy ingredient to dilute the energy density and control the total energy intake. There's a lot of things that have been used to do this. The cereal straws like wheat straw has been the most popular, but uh, around the world I've seen many other examples like rapeseed straw, uh, lower quality grass haze, grass seed straws, corn stover, soybean stover, many other possibilities. The key issue is that we have to get those ingredients processed into a TMR so that the cows cannot sort them because if they sort out that low energy uh, material then we're not accomplishing what we're, we're trying to. And another thing to keep in mind is that ideally we're going to be diluting down what will be essentially the lactation forages. So we're not talking about making major changes here from the dry period to early lactation. So we're, we, we don't want to look at all grass hay during the dry period going to a high corn silage and, and alfalfa haylage diet right after calving. So ideally, we'll be using some of those same forages and just adding the, the uh, lower energy ingredient to dilute the energy density down during the dry period. 
Well, we're back to uh, voting here, and uh, here's your chance. Uh, in these uh, control energy rations, uh, especially those 66% of you, what, why are you doing it? So we'll just let you vote here now and give Dr. Rickley a chance to take a quick break. And the polls are open, Jim. we got them open here, and we're off and running at this stage of the game. And uh, we've got a couple early voters in at this point, uh, and we're slowly increasing. Again, uh, which one of these five? Notice I didn't give you all of the above because you might want to check that one there. But uh, if, if the controlled energy, high-fiber dyes, uh, Dr. Drickley will be talking more about here. Uh, what, in your mind, which one are you looking at at this point? We're up at 51%. Uh, uh, must be slow voting someplace. Must be the lines must be congested this morning, or, or they're just not wanting to commit at this stage of the game. So we'll give you about another four seconds, and then we will go ahead and close the polls. We're getting pretty close to 70%. Uh, here, her go, go, quick, 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 quick. We are closed. Uh, Dr. Drakely, uh, what do we have? All right, well, 88% of you said reduce metabolic disorders, 8% avoid fat cows, 2% increase milk, nobody said result in small calves, and 2% in immune system. And to some extent, with the, with the exception of, of C and D, you, you might be able to argue for all of these. But clearly, the, the largest focus has been on the ability of the, this approach to help reduce metabolic disorders. So we'll talk about some of the other associated benefits as well. So just starting here with a, a summary slide that kind of uh, includes everything that we have at least some degree of evidence for at this point from our work and for our, our field experiences. Um, so the evidence for benefits include, as we've talked about already, lower NEFA, BHBA, and liver fat, so decreasing the, the extent of that negative energy balance. Less cycling of body condition, so we're not adding as much body condition on in, in the dry period perhaps and then losing all of that in early lactation. Clearly the reduction in DAs and other metabolic disorders has been the, the big focus in the field particularly. I'll show you just a snippet of information that we have some evidence that we may have positive effects on the immune system. Uh, we also have put together a number of studies so that we have enough cow numbers to look at reproduction and we have actually a small uh, positive effect on reproduction with this approach. And overall the results indicate no significant loss of milk production. Uh, the one repeatable factor is that we do get slightly lower milk fat content during the very early post-calving period and we'll, we'll expand on that here shortly. So this is an, a, a summary. There's, there's not, unfortunately, a lot of good controlled research data that have looked at large numbers of cows and large numbers of farms to compare disease incidents. Uh, this is survey data from the, the Keenan Company in Ireland, which has been using this, uh, this dry cow approach for a number of years now. And they have accumulated uh, customer data over the years. What I'm showing you here is data from uh, a large number of farms in France. And just looking at the change in incidence or change in occurrence of several conditions here before and one year after adoption of this dry cow strategy. So you can see one year after implementation we have the incidence of retained placenta, uh, about cut in half, a huge decrease in difficult calvings or assisted calvings, uh, big decreases in milk fever and DAs, decreased metritis, and even after one year uh, uh, some evidence that they were moving in the, the right direction in terms of culling rate. So overall, a, a large uh, positive effect in, in terms of health problems uh, in this set of, of farms, and we've seen that uh, many other places as well. As I said, we've, we've looked at uh, uh, putting all of our experimental data together. This is a, a summary of uh, about 450 cows uh, that, that we've looked at different factors over the, the last 10 years. And just to point out here that the uh, prevention of overfeeding during the dry period decreases the risk of DAs by about five times, so five times less risk for DA with the control energy concept, and about two times lower risk for development of, of ketosis by prevention of the overfeeding during the, the far-off and close-up periods. 
Similarly, when we look at reproduction, uh, this indicates that the days to conception was decreased by about 10 days, by 10 days for the controlled energy strategy during the dry period uh, versus the, the overfeeding. Uh, perhaps not stellar reproductive numbers there, but at least the, the trend is moving in the right direction with the, the, con uh, the, the controlled energy. So as we think about implementation then, we'll, we'll start with just a comment about uh, the traditional two-group system, far off and close up. Our research has actually indicated that controlling the energy intake during the far off dry period is probably more important than what we do in the close up period. So one of the first things we would look at on a farm now is, is how those far off dry cows are being managed. And again with uh, the increasing prevalence of corn silage and other good quality forages uh, on farms, it's very easy to allow these cows in the far off dry period to over consume, to eat much more than they, than they need. And so in, in two group systems, avoiding overfeeding in the far off dry period is, is probably more important to transition success than what we do in the, in the close up uh, period. So that's a, an important factor to keep in mind. Uh, we can think about then these controlled energy high fiber dry cow programs that would be single group and, and actually doing away with that uh, steam up or separate close up diet. Here's an example of, of some research that we've done in that area. And this is probably a, a fairly typical uh, controlled energy diet that we would see in many areas of the country. About one third of the total diet dry matter as chopped, uh, as, excuse me, as corn silage, about one third as chopped wheat straw, and then the remainder split between, in this case, some alfalfa hay and a, a small amount of concentrate to balance the, the protein and minerals and vitamins. So we compared that then with a higher energy diet, same amount of corn silage, but no wheat straw and uh, additional concentrate. So uh, just a couple of, of slides of research data here. In this experiment, we had three groups of cows during the dry period. We have the controlled energy, uh, high fiber or high straw, low energy diet in the green. We have a higher energy diet in the red, fed ad libitum. So these cows are being overfed relative to the requirements. And then that same higher energy diet fed in a restricted fashion, similar to the earlier studies that I showed you. So this is dry matter intake uh, as a percentage of the cow's body weight during the dry period and early lactation. Notice that the cows that were fed the high straw, low energy had uh, a fairly flat intake curve throughout the dry period. The cows that were being fed the uh, higher energy diet ad libitum had very high intakes early, but then progressively decreased towards calving. You can see they were actually eating less at calving than the cows with the high bulk diet in this experiment. After calving, the cows that were overfed had uh, the lowest dry matter intakes, although this was not statistically significant in, in this study. So along with those differences in intake, then we have differences in metabolism in the cows. Uh, this slide shows the NEFA concentrations in blood. Not much difference here during the, the late dry period, but the cows that were being overfed start to increase as the cows approach calving. Uh, peak quite high and stay elevated in the what would be considered the, the danger threshold here uh, for several days after calving. In contrast, the controlled energy groups, either the high forage or the restricted intake, had just a modest increase at calving and then uh, began to come down quite quickly. Along with that, the cows that were overfed had much more fat in the liver at uh, one day and 14 days after calving than either of the other two uh, controlled energy diets. So quite a marked difference in the amount of fat accumulating in the liver with the overfeeding. And finally, if we look at BHBA, the ketones in blood, again, the overfed cows increased progressively here after calving so that they almost as a group were up to the subclinical thre uh, ketosis threshold and then remained elevated over the other groups for the the first five weeks of lactation. Again a very modest increase here associated with with uh, early post calving in the other two groups. So uh, these results were certainly very encouraging and, and uh, raised interest in the, the single group dry cow program. So if we look at a direct comparison then of the far off and close up versus the single group, 
Uh, this experiment, we had two diets, high energy, low energy. So the, the low energy diet or was uh, the controlled energy diet. Again, a large amount of wheat straw uh, and a slightly smaller amount of corn silage in this experiment, and smaller amounts of alfalfa hay and silage and concentrate. So we compared the, the groups as shown here schematically. We had a group of cows that was fed the controlled energy, high fiber diet throughout the entire dry period. That's the green. We had a group that was fed the higher energy diet throughout the entire dry period. Those were overfed, so this was really a, a negative control group for us. And then we had a, the two group, the classical far off and close up. So they started on the lower energy diet in the far off dry period and then were switched to the higher energy diet uh, three weeks before expected calving. So as we'll come back to reinforce here several times, the presentation and the the production and presentation of these TMRs is critical. You have to have that straw or other bulky ingredient processed to a particle size that the cows will not sort. And just to show you visually what that looked like in this experiment, uh, where uh, the, the straw particles are, are chopped uniformly. We don't have a large number of, of long, uncut particles, and they're of a, a size that the cows will not consistently sort out. And we had quite detailed measurements of sorting, both chemically and, and use of the, the Penn State shaker box and so on. And when the rations look like this, there's, there's not appreciable sorting. So a little bit of, of uh, data from this experiment. Again, dry matter intakes here is a percentage of body weight. Uh, the controlled energy high fiber single group cows in the green, again, quite a flat intake curve. The cows in the two stage should have been exactly the same in the early part of the dry period, but with the, the variation there, they don't look like they're quite the same. But notice that when we switch the cows from the control energy high fiber to the high uh, energy diet, over the next two weeks they came up to exactly the same intakes as the group of cows that had been eating that diet ad libitum and then followed them down at the same rate as the cows approached calving. So quite an interesting um, e uh, example of intake regulation during this late pre-calving period where bulk is, is certainly having one factor, but then there's obviously some metabolic factors that start to kick in in the last week or two before calving. After calving in this experiment, there was no significant effect on intakes um, due to the pre-calving diets. Beta-hydroxybutyrate, again, the ketones in blood, uh, low during the dry period is expected. A slight increase here in the controlled energy high fiber single group cows in the last few days before calving, but not, uh, not very high. Then all groups shoot up right after calving. The controlled energy high fiber group, the single group, decreased very quickly down to the same baseline as the dry period. The overfed cows went up and, and uh, never came down during the course of the experiment. And the two group cows were, were intermediate. They came up to the same peak concentration and then didn't come down quite as rapidly as the, the single group, but more so than the, than the uh, overfed group. Along with that, then the liver fat content shown here was elevated. Again, the most, um, the most marked increase was in the overfed group. Very little increase in the single group. And the two group cows were intermediate. Just that three week period of higher energy feeding before calving was enough to start some of the same changes in metabolism that we saw with the, the group that was overfed the entire dry period. Overall then, in this experiment, there was really no advantage to the two group system over the single group. So we had no uh, improvement in milk yield, I didn't show you those data, no benefit in body condition loss, no benefit in, in uh, concentrations of NEFA or BHBA or liver fat. In a, a second experiment, we've confirmed that same finding. So uh, another experiment where we compared a two-group system, far off and higher energy close-up, with a single-group controlled energy high fiber. Again, no difference other than the slightly greater milk fat content. So about 0.2 percentage units greater milk fat content during the first six weeks after calving. And that's because those cows were mobilizing more body fat. So I'll just show you that uh, the, those data points quickly here. This is, uh, again, the experiment comparing the single group in the green versus the two group far off and close up in the red. 
We have them broken out by older cows and the solid symbols here and the first calving heifers in the, uh, in the open symbols. Uh, absolutely no difference in milk yield here for the older cows and if anything the, the uh, cows fed the, the single group or the heifers fed the single group control energy high fiber uh, produced slightly more milk. Here's the difference in milk fat content so about point two percentage units advantage, if you will, for the cows that had the close-up feeding before calving, but you see they come together by about uh, seven weeks after calving. So that uh, slightly greater milk fat content is coming from greater rates of body fat mobilization or body fat breakdown, shown here by the differences in NEFA. Cows with the two-group higher close-up feeding had uh, greater NEFA concentrations after calving uh, for the first three weeks um, after calving. And so the cow is putting more of that mobilized body fat into milk fat. So while that uh, six weeks or so is slightly more milk fat, certainly is an economic advantage, it comes with the greater risks uh, associated with higher, higher NEFA and greater negative energy balance. So overall, in the work that we've done in, in uh, uh, three experiments now, there's, there's no clear advantage nutritionally from providing a higher energy steam up or close up group if we're comparing diets that are not widely different in, in forage uh, content before and after calving. Well, we're back to our last polling question, so here's your last chance to vote. Uh, Dr. Drakely asks, what are the management problems to avoid with controlled energy high fiber diets? So your choices are uh, low dry matter intake, uh, particle size of the straw, enough of bunk space, uh, excessive protein intake, uh, uh, or heifers at risk as far as that goes because of something. Who knows? Anyway, you're off and running at this stage. Uh, the polls are now open, and we're up to about 20% at this stage of the game. We seem to have a very, uh, a very uh, dominant uh, one here, but uh, everybody's getting votes except for one group. We cannot tell you, otherwise we'd be skewing the vote. And of course, we in Illinois would never want to skew the vote. Uh, we are known to be a very honest state when it comes to taxing and uh, and uh, voting as far as that goes at this point. Unfortunately, it cannot be like Chicago where you vote early. Jim, we're up to about 70%. Let's close the vote. Uh, Dr. Drake, any big surprises there for you? No, so the, the results here, are 12% said low dry matter intake, 71% large particle size, 10% inadequate bunk space, 6% excessive protein, and nobody said heifers being at risk. And so there's actually more than one correct answer there. Certainly the, the large particle size is a huge factor, and that's the, probably the number one issue that we have to deal with. But we also need to monitor intakes, and to help those intakes, we need to have adequate bunk space. Uh, so I think the, the last two, D and E, are, are probably not factors, but any of A, B, or C probably could be a correct answer. And so let's continue on here and talk about some of the, the factors, why these diets are working, and, and some more management-related issues. number of, of features, then, that we think are important in the, the positive uh, um, results, positive benefits that we see with this type of dietary approach. Certainly, we are improving room and fill, probably an important factor in preventing DAs. Uh, a healthy rumen, certainly. We're not dealing with high levels of, of starch or sugars, uh, and so that, that's probably a factor. We think another factor is that more stable dry matter intake during the dry period and preventing the, the big drop in intake before calving, maybe leading to lower NEFA concentrations. Uh, if we're doing this right, again, we're, we're maintaining some adaptation of the rumen to the lactation rations uh, ingredients. Another factor is, that we think is hugely important is preventing some of these fat cow type responses, responses to the excessive energy consumption. Just show you quickly a, results from a, an experiment that we wanted to look at internal body fat stores. So the, the internal fat that we can't see around the organs and so on. We're very interested in whether the difference in energy intake during the dry period could cause differences in that internal fat. And so in an, in, an, in an experiment that we had non-lactating, non-pregnant cows, unfortunately they're not true dry cows then, but I, I think it's a similar biological situation for the most part. We had two groups of cows that were randomized, so they had the same starting body condition. They were about three body score at, at the dry off. 
Uh, they were fed then either a controlled energy high fiber or low energy diet, or they were fed a higher energy diet for eight weeks, so analogous to a, a typical dry period length. And at the end of that eight-week feeding period, it was very interesting that we couldn't differentiate between the two groups in terms of body condition score. No significant difference there. However, in the internal adipose depots, internal fat uh, that we were able to recover and measure when we slaughtered the cows, you can see a, a huge difference here in fat in the, the omentum and the mesentery. These are, are areas around uh, certain, or certain areas of the gastrointestinal tract, the digestive tract. Much more fat around the kidneys. While it's not shown here, there was fat everywhere. So more fat around the reproductive tract, which might be related to that reduction in difficult calvings, for example. Uh, we're very interested in this mesenteric fat in particular because that's a, a location that is getting a lot of attention in the human medical community. Why, why us old guys are supposed to watch our, our middles here. Uh, and so we're seeing these reductions in the internal fat uh, accumulation here particularly in those sites that the blood drains directly to the liver first. And so these are, again, the bad fat deposits in humans that can be dumping a lot of fatty acids and a lot of other uh, signaling molecules right to the liver. So a large increase in accumulation of these internal fat depots. And remember that we are not able to detect differences in body condition score with those cows. So that's not to say that body condition score is, is worthless. It's just to say that it's not sensitive enough, we think, to detect some potentially significant changes going on inside the cow. Another factor that um, some very interesting recent research with my colleague Juan Lohr in our department were, were showing some positive effects on function of the immune system. So in one of Dr. Lohr's uh, recent PhD students' work, they, they showed benefits to uh, immune cell function if the cows were on the controlled energy diet strategy during the dry period. And as an example here, this is phagocytosis of neutrophils. So that's the ability of white blood cells to engulf bacteria and kill them. And so the, the function of those cells as they're measured after we take them out of the blood from the cow uh, was impaired early after calving if those cows had been overfed during the dry period. So a, a more stable pattern here for the controlled energy cows. So this is pretty exciting relative to, to possible benefits in uh, reduction of, of mastitis or metritis, for example. And finally, uh, probably working through um, maintaining lo lower potassium intake and uh, effects on the DCAD, dietary cation anion difference. So let's look at that a little bit because this is, again, some more recent evidence and I, and I think fairly interesting. These would be our guidelines for controlling blood calcium. Uh, very big believers in looking at magnesium content of the dry cow ration. I want to make sure we have at least 0.4% of the total ration dry matter as magnesium. Potassium, we just want to try to keep as low as possible, which is, is increasingly difficult in most areas of the world. Uh, we can look at the potassium to magnesium ratio, uh, wanting that to be low, less than 4 to 1. And that really is just going to help reinforce that we need to have that magnesium in there. So if we have magnesium at 0.4% or greater, that ratio should be OK. And then phosphorus, uh, typically at uh, NRC requirements of around 0.3% of the total dry matter. Now, one of the interesting things that, that I was made aware of here a few years ago was a, uh, some Dutch uh, research published in a, a thesis many years ago. They were looking at development of milk fever as related to calcium intake. And they found that high calcium intake did not cause milk fever if energy intake was about 1.2 times maintenance but it did if the cows were consuming more energy than that. And so they explained that by better intakes uh, right after calving, uh, possibly also through lower colostrum formation, which I, I'm not sure is true or not, but we can, we can perhaps debate that a little bit later. So an interesting association or observation here with energy intake. We've gone back and looked at that in, in some of our studies. This is from one of the studies I showed data earlier, where we have the cows on the single group, control energy high fiber in the green, the overfed group in the red, and the same over or higher energy diet fed in a restricted manner here in the blue. So blood calcium at calving drops in all groups as we'd expect. 
but the largest change here was in the overfed group and the smallest change was in the cows with the, the controlled energy strategy. So we don't really understand the mechanisms here of, of what's having, uh, happening. It may be related to the, the better intakes uh, and more dietary calcium coming into the cows right after calving, but uh, we suspect there's probably something else going on there as well. But uh, indicating that these diets are, are probably working in the right direction for us at least in maintaining, uh, maintaining calcium in the blood. Should point out also that the overfed group here, the higher nutrient diet was balanced for DCAD, a negative DCAD. So we were trying to help these cows maintain calcium and yet they had the lowest uh, lowest or largest drop in blood calcium at calving. All right, so let's look at some specifications then of, of what these single group diets might look like. Dry matter content or moisture content is, is important and a, a dry matter content of somewhere in the range of 45 to 47 percent seems to work the best. Helps hold the ration together and improve palatability. Uh, once we get above 55 percent dry matter, we're certainly going to see more sorting and lower intakes. The energy density in terms of, of NRC net energy, uh, somewhere in this range, 1.3 to 1.35 megacals per kilo or 0.59 to 0.61 megacals per pound. Again, what we're trying to do is limit total intake to that requirement range, so 15, maybe 16 megacalories for, for larger uh, Holstein cows. These uh, numbers are based on NRC model calculations. So those of you that are using CNCPS, uh, CPM, uh, may find that it's difficult to get the numbers down there. And they, they may run slightly higher based on the, the calculations and analysis. That's OK. Just be consistent and know that that's the, the range that we're targeting. You can also use net energy maintenance values, which uh, gets away from some of the issues related to in, uh, intake discounts and so on with NEL. Uh, another recommendation in related to energy then is, is to use rumensin, and I would say 300 milligrams or more uh, per head daily is a, a good target dose. We've actually looked at uh, rumensin addition uh, in these types of rations or the, the two, two group far off and close up system. So this is the menensin effect here, the menensin in orange. In, uh, this was menensin in the, the dry cow rations. Uh, in the older cows, the solid symbols are first calving heifers. There's a significant effect here on milk yield in both cows and heifers uh, to having menensin in the dry period as well as in the, the lactation ration. So back to the intake thing here and the, the recommendations that I just showed in the previous slide. The, the, you know, I, I can't stress this enough that we need to monitor the cows and know how much they're eating. We have to be uh, confident that the cows are eating what we want them to be eating. Do you know? Do you measure it? Do you monitor it? So if the cows are eating more than, than uh, we have calculated to get that 15 or 16 megacalories in, then we're not controlling intake. If they're eating much less than that, then we may run into some risks of, of underfeeding the cows. So monitoring intake is hugely important. Some other specifications here, crude protein content is, is typically going to be in the 12 to 15 percent range. Uh, more important, the metabolizable protein is estimated by NRC or CPM or something. Uh, trying to shoot for about 11, 1,100 grams per day uh, in older cows or 1,000 grams per day in a mixed group. Usually that's going to uh, mean bringing in some higher bypass source, typically a, a third of a pound of blood meal and maybe some uh, higher bypass soy source. Um, starch content, where we're dealing with lactation rations that have starch contents of, of the mid-20s, then a starch content of about 14% seems to work very well in these, these systems. So we're, we're not, uh, we're not depriving the rumen of starch, but we're controlling that, uh, controlling that starch intake. NDF from forage is a, a good indicator of the maximum intakes. These cows with the bulky forage will not consume more than about 0.8% of their body weight, uh, which again, in a, a, an adult Holstein cow is going to be 4.5 to 5 kilos or 11 pounds uh, of forage NDF daily. And we can actually use that then to go back calculate what the predicted intakes will be. 
Mineral and vitamin specs, again, magnesium more than 0.4%, low potassium, phosphorus at the NRC requirements. I've listed calcium down the list because, frankly, I think that's less important. The evidence from the scientific literature is hugely variable. Uh, as long as we have at least 80 grams of calcium per day in a, a mature Holstein cow, uh, it seems to work all right. Typically for us, that's going to be a, a dietary calcium content of about 0.9%. Uh, but there are people going much lower and much higher and having success. Uh, we are not aggressively trying to acidify these rations anymore. Uh, no, we, we would try to use something that would move the DCAD closer to zero, uh, for example, some mag sulfate, primarily as a source of, of very available magnesium, but also bringing in some anions. And then vitamin E, that's a good story. Pick your number uh, anywhere above 1,000 IUs per day. Uh, clearly some benefits to immune function in, that, in this critical time period. So some common problems in management. Again, where these rations run into problems is not due to the concept, but it's due to the implementation, just like most everything that we deal with. And the number one issue is sorting. When we're not getting the, the straw or other ingredient processed, appropriately so that the cows are able to sort it. Uh, another issue, again, the dietary composition, too different from the pre-calving to post-calving. So going from uh, something in, in uh, going from a dry hay, grass hay pre-calving to a high starch silage based ration after calving. Inadequate access to feed where there's overcrowding, uh, fr uh, push-ups are not frequent enough or not enough being fed. Limited water availability, not adjusting the ration, moldy or poor quality ingredients. A lot of these are things that we would deal with no matter what type of, of dietary strategy we're dealing with, but those first two or three factors are probably extra important for this type of strategy. One final precaution, these are, are not close-up diets alone, so we don't want to be introducing these high bulk diets uh, in a close-up group three weeks before calving. That's because intake will drop for a period of five or seven days as the cows adjust to this high bulk and we don't want to be having that adjustment in the last few days as, uh, as the cows leading up to calving. So we have to think about this as incorporated across the entire dry period or with a far off group, not just something that we're doing in, a, in the close up. So again, reminder of the particle size being a hugely cr critical factor here and just coming to some conclusions and summary. So remember, as we started off, that the non-nutritional factors, the cow comfort, management, moving, grouping, all those issues are a huge, hugely important area. We haven't talked about that today. Uh, I am convinced that on the basis of literature and our research that controlling energy intake to approximately the requirements is the most biologically defensible strategy. We don't overfeed a lot of other uh, species and expect benefits. Uh, increasing energy during the close-up period um, has very minimal, if any, effects on milk yield or any other economic variable. Clearly, the control energy strategy can decrease health problems. Uh, we didn't talk much about this, but the increased energy density in the close-up diet does result in greater lipid mobilization during early lactation, not less. And we're altering uh, metabolism here. We're not just filling the rumen uh, in terms of how the, the, the uh, system is working. So I, I thank you for listening patiently to me, and Mike, we'll turn it over back to you for some questions and wrap up. Well, very good. Let's uh, go back to Steve, and uh, Steve, do you want to make a few comments uh, as we wrap up here for uh, the next uh, webinar is coming? You bet, uh, Mike. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Very interesting and very well presented, uh, very nicely done. We, uh, we thank you. Uh, for that, and uh, Elanco also for their sponsorship. Uh, as you can see, uh, those of you uh, following with us, uh, our next webinar will be July 9th on new corn silage utilization, uh, featuring Mike Hutchins, our good friend down at the University of Illinois, brought to you by, by Biotol Forage and Occupants. And then again, August 13th, we hope you'll be back with us. Uh, five Keys for Reproductive Success, Paul Fricke, University of Wisconsin, and they'll be uh, sponsored by Merck also. Uh, with that, uh, Mike, I will uh, say before I turn it back to you for some questions and discussion, uh, to remind all of those uh, listening in that this, this presentation and all of our previous uh, webinars are available on the archives at, at uh, your convenience at no cost. 
Um, just going to horge.com and clicking on dairyman, Horge Dairyman uh, webinars will get you to the list of past webinars for you to view, whether you have desktop, laptop, tablets, whatever, any device that you might have. Also, a note that um, those of you who uh, participated today will receive a very short six-question survey at some point here in the near future. If you would respond to that for us, uh, we would appreciate it very much. It will help us uh, make sure that our webinars in the future uh, are on target and meet your needs. And with those comments, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, we have a plethora. That's a big word for a Wisconsin farm boy. We have a lot of questions wow. here, Dr. Jim. Let's go ahead and, and take these on. Uh, first question, uh, can you apply this to component-fed uh, herds? Absolutely. It, it's interesting that uh, some people that have been using this idea, like uh, Dr. Gordy Jones, actually started working with component-fed herds and tie stalls in Wisconsin. And so the, the concept can be implemented where we would have a, a partial TMR, perhaps, uh, of uh, a, a certain amount of controlled energy uh, or, or higher energy ingredients, and then having some free choice uh, grass hay or, or something like that available. Obviously, any time we, we are not working with a TMR, we lose control. But it, it can, the concept certainly can be implemented. Another quick question, uh, what are some of the goals you may have for instance rates for some of the metabolic disorders? Uh, this person says like DAs, ketosis, retained placentas, metritis. Do you have any guidelines that would indicate that uh, we really need to make a change in the dry cow program? Yeah, I think that it's very reasonable to get DAs down to less than 1%. And even what people would think of as, as not too bad a rate of DAs of 3 4% probably can be decreased further with, with this type of approach. Uh, Ketosis, if we're running um, uh, 8 or 10% ketosis, that's probably too high. Uh, retains probably somewhere in that same neighborhood. Uh, forget the rest of the question. We try to cows culled in 60 days, so on. I, I think that uh, some of the, the new guidelines for cows leaving the herd in, in the first 60 days are, are certainly achievable, and they're much lower than the, the, you know, the types of rates that we were seeing probably 10 years ago. Very good. Uh, what would be the ideal time to check uh, for uh, blood nephas and beta hydroxybutyric acid in cows as they approach calving, and are there critical numbers that you'd be targeting? Yes, the NEFA is uh, the best measurement before calving, and those cutoff points are, are usually about 0.4 millimolar uh, NEFA, and that's anything from uh, four days to maybe 20 days or so prior to the due date. Uh, after calving, BHBA is probably the, the easiest measure and, and still very accurate, although you can use NEFA after calving as well. Uh, so the crisis control measure, if these are, are raised in the uh, pre-calving period, uh, you, you've got to look at intake, you've got to look at the, the overcrowding, which is a, a very common cause of, of elevated NEFA. Uh, so bunk space, access to feed, other stress points usually within the, uh, within the, the management program. Uh, after calving, if we're having high, uh, high BHBA or high NEFA, then we need to be looking at that fresh cow program. Uh, again, some of the same non-nutritional factors. More, more opportunities perhaps for intervention there with uh, drenching or with, with uh, glucogenic supplements and so on. Well, we have another question, Jim, from uh, looking at the fresh cows and a bit concerned that if we can't get these cows to eat enough feed, uh, how is the restricted diet going to help? Uh, should we not look at feeding more concentrates after calving to help with this lesser dry matter? Yeah, well, let's make sure we're, we're thinking clearly about where the restriction is, is happening. We're talking about leading up to calving, and certainly then at calving, we, we're not talking about restricting intake or restricting energy. Uh, and, and so uh, the restricted or, or controlled intake before calving is going to work by hopefully improving the, the intake of the cows after calving. But we need to make sure that we have a, uh, you know, a, an energy-rich diet going into the cows as quickly as we can after calving. Interesting question here. A person is looking at: Could you use that uh, that uh, high straw diet uh, for a lactating ration, so you don't have to change a diet or right at calving? Uh, or is that suitable for a fresh cow ration? 
Yeah, it's an interesting question. Again, the, the, from a DCAD standpoint, uh, yeah, I think it could be used and perhaps as a, a transition ration with the fresh cows. Uh, and again, it's pretty low energy, so we don't want those cows uh, on just that uh, ration for very long after calving. But perhaps we could use uh, you know, a blending of some of that and the, the lactation TMR to help the first couple of days after freshening. Dr. Drakeley, a question here is, uh, is there a piece of equipment or a type of uh, process that would do a better job getting the straw ready for, the, for, this, for these rations? Uh, yeah, I'm not an equipment guy, but uh, certainly some of the, the uh, 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 what am I trying to say, the, the uh, tub grinder or, or bale buster types of things do a pretty good job. Uh, I've actually seen some pretty good results with people uh, pre-processing the straw in a vertical auger type mixer and then having it go back in for, for more mixing when the ration is prepared. Uh, so there's, I mean, there's a variety of options from standalone equipment to just trying to, to utilize the existing mixers uh, uh, better. Here's a little bit longer question. Uh, can, can you please refer back to the first lactation heifers and their milk production coming off of the controlled energy diets? Uh, this individual says we've heard and seen from some producers that these heifers start out slower in terms of uh, milk and peak milk on heifers. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, our results have certainly shown the opposite. In the, the three experiments that we've done comparing cows and heifers in these diets, uh, if anything, the cows coming off the controlled energy program do better than the cows that are put on a higher energy ration. Um, so, I mean, one thing to keep in mind is that our heifers are probably coming off something that's a lot more like that ration than our, our cows going dry after a, a lactation. And so the, the adaptations maybe are, are not as uh, pronounced for those cows. Uh, the other thing that, that, of course, is a factor is how those heifers are being brought back in with the, uh, with the dry cow program. If they're being raised off-site, are they coming back soon enough to be accustomed? Uh, we, in our experiments, we've typically gone at least five weeks uh, and, and sometimes six or seven weeks with the heifers on those diets. Uh, any comment on having the, the first calf or springing heifers with the dry cows? Is, is any changes in those herds as far as this diet? Yeah. Again, if we're looking at uh, the, the types of specifications that, that we talked about here today, the, the bigger issues are going to be making sure that those heifers can compete at the feed bunk so that there's enough uh, feed access. The cows are going to eat on these diets for a good portion of the day. Uh, and as long as we have adequate feeding space, then the heifers and cows will, will do very well, I think, on the, the, same, uh, the same diet. But certainly in an overcrowded situation, overcrowded relative to feed availability, uh, those, those heifers may be at a disadvantage. But I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try to adjust the ration if they're being housed together. Would you bump up the metabolizable protein? Uh, some of the NRC says they have a higher requirement. Yeah, I, that's the one thing that, that if you're running a mixed group, I would certainly run at the high, high end of the range uh, for metabolizable protein and try to make sure that we're meeting the requirements on those heifers, even if that may mean uh, that, that the cows get a little more than they need. Uh, I think you've answered this, but let's ask it again. How long does a straw have to be when run through the Keenan mixer to, uh, to get the optimal particle size? Um, that, uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can answer that off the top of my head, but it's the, the straw would typically go in as the, the first ingredient and probably a, you know, a, a number of revolutions there. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to remember maybe five minutes or something in the, the straw. Uh, in addition to the, the time then as the other ingredients are added. Uh, due to the Keenan mixer has a very specific timing, do they not, on feed ingredients on that? So yeah. that's kind of unique with that system. Yeah, they've, they've tried to develop the algorithms uh, with their, their automated control system that, that um, tells which ingredients should be added first and how long they're, they're processed and cut before the second ingredient and so on. And so that is kind of a neat control feature. We do have a, just a comment here. We'll just put it in because it fits well, and that is uh, one of our participants say a pull-type chopper, putting uh, the big squares through a pull-type chopper works really well and then blowing it into Commodity Bay, and that's yeah, pretty close to a tub grinder as far yeah. as that goes. A couple of other additives maybe you want to comment on briefly, Jim. I know it's not part of your, th your theme here, but uh, what about rumen-protected choline and niacin to lower uh, NIFAs and impact of beta-hydroxybutyric acid? 
Yeah, well, certainly the, the choline, uh, we, we've done some work with that, and the research base is, is very strong for benefits there. Uh, so I would, I would certainly look at, these, at that product as a very helpful ingredient for the short term. So if we have situations where we, we're having problems with heavy cows or ketosis or poor transitioning, that, that that's a helpful uh, uh, first line of defense as we're trying to work out maybe longer term, bigger issues. Uh, the, the rumen protected niacin, uh, can be um, the, the data that I'm aware of. It's pretty powerful in lowering NEFA, uh, but uh, probably less uh, data to this point about um, benefits within that whole context of the transition. So, again, um, helpful aids in the short term uh, as we're trying to work through some of these other issues. We have one final question. It must feel like a prelim here almost. <laughs> uh, holy cow, I tell you. And, and the amazing part, you got all the answers right. Anyway, what is your uh, guidelines on amino acid balancing for these transition cows? Are you worried about that? Yeah, that's a, I guess I would say that's an emerging area. Um, and certainly in terms of lysine and methionine, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, requirements of about 75 grams of lysine and 25 grams of methionine uh, that you'd get out of uh, NRC or CPM predictions. Uh, and that's an area that um, that is going to be, uh, that will need some attention. We mentioned the metabolizable protein, but I think the, the methionine uh, in particular, there's quite a bit of interest in, in uh, looking at methionine supplementation to these types of rations as a, an alternate strategy to trying to bring in a lot of, uh, a lot of lower degradability protein sources. So that's uh, about all I can say at this point. I think that is an area that we're going to see some more progress on in the next few years. Well, Dr. Drakeley, you've done yeoman's work uh, on this. Uh, Steve, I think we'll turn it back to you and okay. let you wrap it up. Well, thank you again, uh, Jim Drakeley, for your wonderful presentation. And, uh, very well done. Lots of interest among our participants. Uh, we also thank Elanco for their sponsorship and hope you uh, listeners and your colleagues will be with us uh, on uh, July 9th for uh, Jim or uh, Mike Hutchins' uh, discussion of corn silage and uh, Paul Fricke on five keys for reproductive success in August. So hope to have you back with us. Thanks for being with us today.